Welcome to I Love to Tell the Story, a podcast on the Narrative Lectionary. I'm Rolf Jacobson. And I'm Christopher Fan Kaufman. And today we're talking about Mark 2, 1 through 22, which is the reading for January 7th, 2024. And last week we saw that Mark starts right in the middle of things with the baptism of Jesus, the testing in the wilderness, and the calling of the first disciples, and it does not slow down. So here... I always think this is a wonderful detail where in Mark 2, verse 1, Jesus has a house and it is in Capernaum. He returned to Capernaum after some days and it was reported that he was at home. And so we see that even from the beginning, when Jesus is in his own home, there's something unusual going on about him. That People are all clustered around his front door and there is not even room around them. So... People are beating their door down to get to Jesus. I, I, I want to call attention to a resource uh, that people might be interested in on YouTube. Um, there are various um, performances of the Gospel of Mark, and uh, especially one on YouTube I found helpful. Uh, uh, the ones I like best are just one person performing in the whole Gospel. David uh, Rhodes used to do this. Uh, and he uh, um, w- would do the whole thing. Uh, there's one by Max McLean. It's called Gospel of Mark. And it, it, it and you can either watch the whole thing or it's broken up into chapters. So you, uh, when I was at a congregation that was doing the narrative lectionary, we would, uh, when the year of Mark, we would show that. So we would show a whole chapter of this um, performer. And I think this is probably much closer to how people would have experienced it in the first century uh, that people didn't, most people couldn't read. And so these things were read to them. Um, I, I have no idea whether the, do you, Christopher, know, do we know anything about the style of reading? Was it, was it, in, was it boring or did they, uh, uh, given the interpretive uh, slant to it? Yeah, so we know very little about it, and we don't have good analogs to this. So Whitney Shiner, if you're interested in reading more about this, is probably the scholar who has spent the most time thinking about this. The problem is that we know what it looked like more in terms of dramatic readings, so theater productions. We know more what poetry sounded like. But long narratives like this Remember, Mark is inventing a new genre here, and so it's very hard to know how they would have uh, how they would have presented it. But what we do know, and I think this is this goes to the the presentation that Max McLean gives, is that reading in the ancient world was just as often memorizing as it was looking at the page and reading it off the page. So it's very probable that the person who is uh, reading this to its original audience has actually gone over it many, many times and memorized it and is using the text as a prop to help them remember what they're supposed to say. And so they are giving much more of what we would think of as a dramatic reading than the usual way that we see uh, lectors read from a pulpit. So I think that that's a that's the most that very we helpful. can say. Yeah. No, that's very helpful. Um, and that would especially uh, uh, Greek was written with no spaces between words, mm-hmm. and oftentimes uh, the 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 words that happen over again, like Jesus Christ, they would just give you the first letter, mm-hmm. the iota, and then and then a letter to indicate the case, and so it. You couldn't very well read from a script because it was so difficult with the things all smushed together. So memorizing and performing. All right, so four, uh, three big stories here. First, Jesus heals the paralytic in his house, as you mm-hmm. mentioned. Second of all, he calls Levi. And then third, the one I'm excited about the most is the story about uh, fasting and then a couple sayings, which I love the sayings. But first, let's talk about the paralytic, um, uh, the man who's lowered down uh, into Jesus' house. Yeah, this is a great story because, again, as I said, in terms of the first verse and then when you think about the performance of it, 
it's so wonderful because of the details that Mark gives us. Mark is not simply relating this in kind of bland prose, but he talks, he narrates, first of all, the great crowd around the door, this folks who bring their friend on a mat and can't get to the door because of the crowd. So they crawl up on the roof and they take the tiles off. If you grew up in California like me, uh, you see these Spanish uh, revival houses with those uh, orange tiles on them, which is what I always Im imagined that this was like. Uh, but again, the, Mark is giving these wonderful details of the story to describe the real, we talked last week about the faith in following Jesus, the real lengths that these this man's friends go to. Not only do they have to take the tiles off, the roof was thatched. It had grass and mud on it. They have to dig through the roof. Can you imagine this is going on while Jesus is trying to speak inside of his house? Uh, and they make a big hole too. They let, they let a, a whole mat uh, through the ceiling. So again, as you're thinking about the Gospel of Mark, you can emphasize the narrative, the way that this is a, is a wonderful story. It's artfully told. And that's, I think, an important thing. Then comes the scandal. My teacher, Jim Nestigan, said, at the start of Mark, you preach the questions. And so uh, Jesus sees their faith. Well, that's interesting. What does that mean? And so he says to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven. And then here comes the question, why does this fellow speak in this way? It is blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And uh this charge of blasphemy ends up being the thing that, in the end, gets Jesus in, uh, in relationship to his Jewish community. Uh, the uh, The Romans don't so much care about this, but uh, why does this fellow speak in this way? What, how, uh, how, what would your answer? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Yeah, I want to, before we get to that, I want to take a quick moment because you bring up how important blasphemy is in this. And we often think of blasphemy in terms of the second commandment. To speak blasphemously is to take the Lord's name in vain, to say something like, oh my God. Uh, whereas in this case, it's very obvious that they are concerned with Jesus exercising the prerogatives of God that Jesus is doing things that only God should be doing. And that's what constitutes blasphemy. And we'll see that again as we get uh, to the trial of Jesus. But I just, I wanted to, to make that point there. And uh, can uh, well, I'm going to jump in there too. Well, go for it. I don't think we, in our culture, don't take, we do not take blasphemy seriously as a sin. Um, but it is actually part of the first commandment. So the first commandment, uh, have no other gods, and the positive version of it in the Shema, love the Lord your God. And blasphemy then is to say something that's not true, uh, to say something untrue about God, or to claim that some other God is God. These are very serious uh, sins. And in this case, that's... Uh, I think you're getting both. You're getting the sense that Jesus is asserting by his forgiving the person's sin, he is asserting that there is, that he is divine. Mm -hmm. And I do want to say that this is one of those places where uh, I, I think you're right. Within modern Western society, we don't take blasphemy seriously. And that has caused a lot of difficulties, especially in, uh, situations where there are, we see this in Europe, especially where there are large Islamic populations, is that Muslims continue to take blasphemy very seriously, sometimes with very tragic results. And so I think that's something to consider. And this is a highly charged scene that we may miss because of our uh, lack of knowledge on kind of how serious blasphemy was as a as a charge. This, so this is a very interesting passage because it makes me think a lot. One of the things, if you remember back to your early church history class and you think about the theological controversies in the early church, uh, the largest one and the one that continues to come up is the theological controversy around what is called Arianism. 
And Arianism was quite the very simple proposal by a man named Arius that you have God, and then just below God, you have Jesus, who is God-like, who is God-ish, but is not himself God. And the question that continues to come up with Arianism is, who can forgive sins but God alone? That if Jesus is just God-ish, is just like God, what do we make of all this language that we have about the forgiveness of sins in Jesus Christ, salvation in Jesus Christ, etc.? These are all, and this is what eventually the early church charged Arius with, was blasphemy. That if Jesus is not God, Jesus cannot forgive sins. And we see this operative right here in Mark 2. Awesome. The, the middle story uh, where uh, Jesus calls Levi um, sh is showing that the way of Jesus is not the way that anyone would expect Messiah to operate because he calls a tax collector and then it ends with why does he eat with tax collectors? excuse me, tax collectors and sinners. And Jesus said, I have come not to call the righteous, but sinners, which is good news for those of us who are sinners. Mm. But there's also, what's a tax collector and why, why, I mean, that sounds like an honest job to me. You know, I did a funeral for a tax collector a few years ago. He was a great guy. Yeah. So this is a great one. And it's very, I think this is one you should potentially preach on because there is a series on Amazon that has become very popular about the 12 disciples called the chosen. And this series is very uh, well produced. It's uh, fun to watch. They really invest in the characters, but there's some funny misunderstandings that go on in this series. And when they talk about this particular character, so Levi, who is called Matthew in the gospel of Matthew, they portray him as autistic and they portray him as becoming a tax collector because he's interested in numbers and he's interested in counting and that this is the reason. <laughs> and I saw this, I, I thought it was, uh, it was really funny because you're the main qualification of being a tax collector in the ancient Roman world. There were two of them. Number one is that you had to be willing to be on the bad side of all of your neighbors. And number two is you had to have either yourself the physical size and strength or to know people who you could boss around who had the physical size and strength to make people pay their taxes. This wasn't like modern taxes where you fill out a form and they deduct it from your paycheck and so forth. This is going to people's houses and taking their sheep or going to people's houses and taking their grain and so forth. And the way that you made money, this is, I think, is where I'll end this uh, diatribe. The way a tax collector made money is they took more than the person owed in taxes and the excess that they took was their salary. <laughs> so you can see why people are a little bit annoyed that Jesus calls a tax collector as his disciple and then goes to his house for dinner because he's eating dinner on their dollar. This is scandal. <laughs> Is there some sense also that um, this is so this is in Galilee, this is happening uh, where there is both a um, Jewish king? Uh, is this one of the Herods or is this? Uh, yeah, this is one Herod. of Herod's sons. You know, this is the Herod that we think of as killing John the Baptist, Herod, Tetrarch of Galilee. Yeah. yeah and the Romans. Mm -hmm. So the. Uh, the taxes are ending up in the, some of them are ending up in uh, King Herod's uh, pockets and some are ending up in Rome. So there's, a, you have to also be willing to kind of betray your own people. Oh, and I think in this case, almost exclusively, they're ending up there because the actual temple tax would be paid in person when you went on pilgrimage to Jerusalem for the Passover. And so here, this is only for the Roman administration and for whatever uh -huh. Her Herod wants to do. So uh, again, you're right. These are, these are folks who are on the bad side of all their neighbors. So obviously the scandal though, that um, there is no one that Jesus is not 
wishing to reach and call to follow him. And uh, that, that includes sinners. Mm -hmm. Last story um, about um, why do your disciples not fast? And then Jesus, uh, well, he says, you know, they can fast once I'm gone, essentially. <laughs> but then he ends with what I just, two things I love. He goes, no one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old cloak. Otherwise, once it is washed and shrinked, uh, it, it'll tear. It'll make a, a bigger hole. No one puts new wine in old wine skins, or the wine will burst the skins, uh, which I love, especially the second one, as a metaphor for what happens to one's life when the gospel gets inside you. Uh, it, 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 it necessarily blows up your old ways of living, and it also even blows up the old ways of the religious order, how, they, how we as religious folk have... Uh, tried to organize ourselves. I love this line so much. It makes me just think about the power of the word of God as a, a chain reaction happening inside of the earth and vessels that we are and blowing things apart. Yeah, I don't know if any of you have taken part uh, since the pandemic in the whole fermentation craze, but if you've ever put a jar of a live sauerkraut or something, a glass jar in your fridge and forgotten about it. What does it do? It blows the jar up. It's not, you know, when you think about wine will burst the skins. That's what we're talking about. It's an explosion. There's wine everywhere. There's wine skin everywhere. Nothing can be the same.